Well, hello everybody and welcome back to week three of the podcast. We are so excited once again to have you with us. Uh, we're looking forward to an absolutely fantastic night. Uh, week one was a big piece of Genesis, uh, if you were along with us. Uh, week two was a, another big piece of Genesis. Uh, and this week is a third big piece of Genesis. We've, well, we've gone through 50 chapters by the end of this week in three weeks. Uh, but it's uh, this evening we're focusing on the story of Joseph. It's a story that's familiar to a lot of people, whether or not they have grown up in the church or whether or not you may have uh, just are new to the Bible or exploring Christianity. Uh, Joseph, Joseph has been made famous, perhaps uh, most famous, by his coat of many colors. Uh, and if that maybe rings a bell for you, if you're not uh, full up to speed on the story of Genesis and the story of, of Joseph, today will be great because it's going to give you some context for that. As always, we love the fact that you guys can participate with us as we move along. And uh, the best way for you to do that, as always, is through texting us. And the, the number to text us at is uh, 250-740-1026. And that'll be available as the night goes on. So feel free to text on that as we're moving along. And we'll get you, uh, hopefully get your questions into the queue as we're able to. Uh, the other thing we want to let you know is that you can listen to this as an audio podcast through the week. Maybe you're watching tonight and you heard something you like and want to re-listen to it again later this week as you're doing your workouts or you're in your car. And Spotify and Apple Podcasts, uh, you can search for 2020 Challenge and you will find those uh, really easily uh, in those two places, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. As well, uh, as always, we've uh, given you some great resources uh, at oceansidechurch.ca uh, slash 2020. So make sure you track those down, the least of which is, uh, or uh, not the least of which, is the chronological Bible that we're using as we move through this year uh, to study the scriptures. Uh, we, as, uh, as a, a church and as a community, are journeying through the scriptures this year in a chronological order, uh, Genesis through Revelation, but not in the order that the books are put together in the Bible. The books in the Bible, as you may know, are grouped together, uh, and so we're going to change that around a bit, and we're going to move through it all chronologically. And so already this year, as we've been reading, we've been uh, reading from Genesis, but we've also been reading some stuff out of uh, Chronicles, the book of First Chronicles and Second Chronicles. And next week, uh, we're actually going to be moving into the next book of the Bible chronologically, which is the book of Job. And then we'll come back to Exodus. So we're moving along around a fair amount, but we're doing it chronologically. And we're looking forward to it. So, hey, quick shout out tonight to so many people who have joined us tonight. Uh, I see just in the chat here on YouTube, uh, Jaden, Hannah, Amy, shout out to you guys. Uh, I see Anne, uh, Sharon, I see the Perplic family, I see uh, Ricky is there with us, uh, we see Emma there tonight, and I'm sure there's a number of others as well who just haven't had the ability because they don't have an account or just uh, a little shy in the corner, haven't said hello yet, but it's great to see all of you and just want to encourage you to interact with us as this is going by asking your questions and we'll see how many of those that we can address as we're moving along. So uh, yeah, as I say, it's, it's going to be great. We're going to move from day 14 through day 18 this week, uh, from Genesis 37 uh, through to Genesis 50. I realize, for those of you who are doing the reading challenge, you've also the last couple of days been moving into the book of Job. We're going to do all of Job next week. So it's going to be a big teaching lesson next week, but we're really excited, Mark and I, about it. And so uh, you'll have to mark your calendars to join us again next week at 717. The last thing I want to talk to you about before we jump into the teaching and say hello to Mark tonight uh, is simply this. Uh, if you've got an opportunity right now to grab the link from this uh, live stream, uh, or if you're listening to it later in the week, this audio podcast, and just share it right now on your social media and invite others to jump in and join us, whether that's on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, wherever it is, Snapchat it out. Uh, we would love to have others join us tonight for this teaching and to join us throughout the week with the audio podcast as it uh, repeats and is available for uh, people to listen to throughout the week. So do that now if you've got a moment. And without further ado, I want to invite my good friend Mark, uh, who's teaching with us tonight to uh, jump into it all. And you know what, Mark, I've just realized another one of these production glitches that uh, I have not set your screen up properly tonight. So I'm going to do that. Why don't you say hello and uh, we'll jump into it. Yeah. 
Thank you, Dan. And thank you for what you do. Uh, I love that you're the techno guy and I'm not. <laughs> so appreciate what you're doing, Dan. Um, yeah, like Dan said, I'm excited. We've had to cover so much ground that uh, last week we looked at three, the lives of three different people. Uh, next week is going to be the monster Job all in one night. But it's just nice to be able to slow down a little bit tonight. Uh, and I hope maybe some questions come in just on one life tonight in Joseph. So let's pray together before we start. Lord, thank you for this opportunity, and Lord, I thank you that you're here present with us wherever we are watching or listening. Holy Spirit, we just invite you to be our teacher tonight. Lord, we open our hearts up, we soften our hearts to whatever it is that you want to bring to us and through us tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, let's get started. We're going to look at the 14th, as Dan had mentioned, and right away we see uh, in the last couple of verses before the reading on the 14th, the descendants of Israel, or Jacob. Um, we see these 12 boys. So the sons of Israel were Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Joseph, Benjamin, Lee, Gad, and Asher. So this may not have come together for you, but you think about the 12 tribes of Israel that we read about later on in the Bible. These are tribes that came from each of these men. So that's where the, the 12 tribes of Israel came. Israel came. They came from the, the sons of Joseph, I mean of Jacob. Uh, also called Israel. So that's sort of the background for there. But we start into the life of Joseph, uh, Joseph the dreamer. And right away, we see that uh, there's some favoritism in the family, never a good thing, but his father has favored Joseph and made him this fancy code and, you know, kind of been daddy's boy, if you want to maybe see it that way. And his brothers resented that right away. Um, and then Joseph gets this dream, two dreams, actually, that indicate a bowing down of his brothers. And in the second dream, even made his mom and dad at some point. Um, so he gets these prophetic dreams. And I'll use the word prophetic a lot in our teaching over the year. And I just want to explain it, sort of a, its most basic meaning. I understand prophetic as being someone who speaks for God. And there are many ways that God communicates those prophetic messages to us and through us. One of those is through dr dreams. Uh, it's a valid method that God uses. We see it throughout all the scripture. Uh, Jesus' life was directed through his parents with dreams for safety and just all through the scripture. We'll be running across it a lot. But there's a significant two dreams that are given to Joseph. And when you think about the prophetic ministry, there's really three steps to working through something that God gives you. The first step we would call observation. So this is just what did God say? This is just the information or the download or the picture or the scripture or the message. The second step is interpretation. This is what did God mean? So this is where you're working through to say, okay, now what do I, what is the meaning behind all of this? And the third step is application. And that is what's my part in what you've communicated to me, God. If you're interested in this um, Oceanside School of the Bible, we did a course a couple of years ago called Growing in the Prophetic. Uh, you'll find that on the church website, OceansideChurch.ca. There's a little school drop-down. And just look for the class, Oceanside Church, Oceanside School of the Bible, Growing the Prophetic. It's know, eight or nine weeks. But if you're interested, you can see more of that. So three steps, observation, interpretation, application. Joseph got two of the three right. <laughs> you know, he got the observation right. He was able to remember and record the dreams. He got the interpretation right that his brothers were going to bow down to him. But I think he kind of dropped the ball in the third part for application. It probably would have been better in this stage in his life, in this context, for him not to say this dream to his brothers. Because we see they just lose it uh, when he talks about that dream. And it's sort of the straw that breaks the camel's back. Um, and we see what goes through in this situation. And, you know, one of the brothers speaks up and they throw him in the pit. They get a chance to be able to sell him off to uh, traders that are coming through for the money. Um, and I think we see the beginning here of this cover-up that all these brothers now have to go through. And I really see it, as we talked about last week, it's a second generation thread or sickness in the family that has to do with the seat. Uh, so these brothers are making up this cover-up. The thing about one lie is it always leads to more lies. <laughs> All through the night tonight, the brothers are always backpedaling and having to cover this one lie. Uh, so we see, you know, he's sold off to, to um, a foreign nation. And then we come to the story of Judah and Tamar. Now, if you've got kids, again, this is a rated M component. You might want to turn the audio down or something for a moment. But 
Tamar um, marries one of the sons, uh, and that son dies. And in the ancient tradition where we're in now, there's a thing called leveret marriage. What that means is if a, if a woman's husband dies, she can marry one of the other brothers to produce heirs and retain the inheritance of the family. Um, so that's called leveret marriage. And that happens for Tamar. Her husband dies and she goes to the next husband. And, uh, you know, he doesn't uh, perform his husbandly duties, if you want to put it that way. Uh, and actually both of these men die. And Judah, the, her father-in-law, says, okay, I got one last kid. I'll, when he grows up, you can marry him. And then sends her back to her family. Uh, but as we know, he doesn't keep his promise. And uh, later on in the story, it gets really weird because, you know, Judah ends up having sex with her, thinking she's a prostitute. Um, we've talked about this before, but one thing about the Bible is that it records the good and the bad in the human experience. And this is one of those situations, the bad in the human experience from the brother Judah. He's made a number of super critical errors here. Number one, he's got an unfulfilled promise to this widow. Uh, so he kind of ignores her. He goes and seeks sex through a prostitute. That's a bad idea. Uh, and then when, he, when it's revealed that she's pregnant, he's got this double standard against Tamar. He wants to have her burned. Of course, she saves some things to prove who the father is. And he has to admit, hey, you know, you're, you're more righteous than I am. But it's a dark place in the story of what we're looking at tonight. Um, but we contrast Judah's failures, particularly his, his sexual immorality and his just loss of moral compass with uh, Joseph. Because we come into this situation with Joseph in Potter's household. You know the story. Uh, Potiphar's a wealthy man. His wife has got too much time on her hands. And uh, she's checking out, you know, Joseph Abs, And she makes a move to him. And she continues to come on to him sexually. Um, and Joseph, at one point, has to flee and run away uh, to, to get away from her in this temptation. And I think one of the things that's really neat about Joseph is he was a man of integrity. And uh, integrity, someone has said, is who you are when no one's looking. And Joseph makes a choice to be a man of integrity, even at, when it comes at great personal cost to him. If you look at Genesis 39, 9, uh, he's trying to explain to this woman why he's not going to go to bed with her. And he says, it would be a great sin against God. That's a really key understanding in terms of resisting sexual temptation. A lot of times we think it's just between a woman and a man and, and nobody else gets involved and nobody else gets hurt. But scripture tells us there's a, there's a spiritual component in this. Remember Psalm 51, if you know that, of David, when he sins with Bathsheba, after all the dust settles, he says to God, against you only have I sinned. Um, so you see that understanding in Joseph's life already saying, look, this is not just wrong in a lot of ways. It's wrong before God. And and. Joseph runs away from this sexual temptation. Let me just say, don't linger near temptation, especially sexual temptation. If you're in a place where you're going to be tempted and you know that, don't try to be strong. Just get away because a sexual temptation will sneak up on you. And Joseph was wise enough just to run. But, of course, it ended up costing him a lot. Uh, he loses his position there and is, sold, and is sent off to prison from that. But he's willing to do the right thing, even though there's a great cost in that. So we pick him up. He's put in prison at the end of the reading on the 15th there. But look what it says in Genesis 39, 21. The key thing we're going to see a lot more about. In, in prison, uh, languishing there, the scripture says, But the Lord was with Joseph in prison and showed him his faithful love. Or other translations call this loyal love. This is a key thing we're going to see throughout the, uh, the Old Testament. This is a characteristic of God, this faithful love or this loyal love uh, that he gives to his people. And it's just a very, very rich thing, even in times of difficulty. And we're going to watch for that because we're going to see it coming up a lot of different places. Um, but the saying goes, you can't keep a good man down or you can't keep a good woman down. Uh, my grandfather used to say, cream rises to the top. And a man of integrity, even in prison, he starts to get more responsibilities and starts to get more um, profile in that place, just like he had done in Potiphar's household, because integrity doesn't go long unnoticed. And Joseph was a man of integrity, uh, and he gets his increasing responsibilities in the, the, in the dungeon, in the prison, uh, as he grows.
So that finishes up 14. Anything out of there, Dan, that uh, we have question-wise we want to yeah, talk thanks about? thanks so much. Uh, so much in there. And I mean, right off the top, even before we dived into the scripture verses, you started talking about uh, those, those three kind of grids that we need to run all of our scripture reading through and our, our Bible study through, and that's observation. Uh, you know, what, what does God say or what does the scripture say? Uh, interpretation. Uh, what does God mean? Uh, what uh, and there's there's uh, as we read the scriptures in there as well. There's there's cultural and all those pieces as well. And and then third, uh, what's application? What's my part? And I think uh, for those of us taking notes tonight, maybe, and I'd encourage you guys all to uh, to have your pens and have your books and, and take notes as we study through this this year. Uh, those three points of observation, interpretation, application, uh, right there. That's uh, that's if 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 you were paying to get into this, boom. Worth worth, worth the, price. the price. There we go. But uh, so that's good. <laughs> you get what you pay. For, what you pay for, Dan? <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, yeah, we did have one question coming out of this, uh, and it's it's kind of the what I kind of call the the kind of the sandwich chapter in here. We start with the story of uh, Joseph uh, in thirty seven. We continue with the story of Joseph in thirty nine. But right there in thirty eight, it suddenly switches right to to Judah and his uh, his sons um, and uh, Ur, who marries. Uh, Tamar and and then dies because of his wickedness uh, before he gives her a child. Uh, Onan, uh, his brother, who refuses to provide for her by fathering a child with her, and his life is also then ended by the Lord. And then Judah's third son, who's promised to her but never ends up uh, coming together with her. And so eventually uh, she tricks Judah, as the story and the reading went on, into fathering Perez, one of the, her children, Perez, who is actually in the lineage of Jesus. Uh, why did the Lord end the lives, here's the question, of Ur and Onan, but not of Judah and Tamar? And just to dig down a bit more into, I think, what's meant here is, wasn't all their sin equal? Why, you know, we, we see that it's not great to have Joseph playing favorites with his father. Is God playing favorites with people here? Um, why do some actions lead to death and others to mercy? Uh, how, does, how does that work? Uh, any insights into that tonight, Mark? Yeah, that's a really big question. I bet you we're going to come back to this question a lot in the next 50 weeks. Yeah. Uh, just initially, I would say that all sin uh, has the same penalty. So in Romans, it says, uh, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. So sin always brings separation. Um but even though all sin has the same penalty, not all sin has the same consequences. Hmm. Uh, so if I lie to you, you know, it might not have a real obvious consequence. If I murder you, it's quite a different consequence. Sure, absolutely. I don't think we really know the depth of what was going on here with these two guys. We know a little bit more about the second one. but So it's hard to understand and evaluate in you know, half a verse what was going on. I trust God to know that there was something worthy of him taking their life. Um, so the consequences were more significant. You know, I don't, I don't, can't exactly say why he saved uh, Judah. I mean, Judah's the line, the lineage of Jesus, but he's messing up big time too. So yeah. in situations like this, I think I just have to defer to say I trust God in his wisdom, and we don't know too much really, looking back 3,000 years about what went on there. But it must yeah. have been very serious. Okay, good. Thanks for those insights. Let's, uh, let's continue on. Let's move to uh, day 15. Yeah, so we're 15. I uh, just want to say a little bit about what a cupbearer is. You might not be bearer is. You might not be familiar with that. The baker, we get who that is. These are the two guys that are, he's in prison with. Cupbearer was a critical role in ancient. The cupbearer was a person who took a drink of whatever the king or the pharaoh was going to drink and ate something before. In ancient times, a great way to assassinate someone was to poison them. So the cupbearer had a very critical role uh, in in tasting and drinking everything that that uh, king or whoever it was uh, ate. And so it was a trusted role. Uh, if you think about in you know, other times in scripture, we know if that person is looking sick, that's a, not such a good sign, right? So that's who the cupbearer is. And in Genesis 48, um, these two guys have dreams. We know the story. Um, and right away, what's neat about who Joseph is, uh, they say, who can interpret these dreams? Right away, Joseph says, interpreting dreams is God's business. And I love right away that Joseph is not taking credit for this supernatural ability that God has given him. Anything that we have in the area of spiritual gifts that God has given us and enablements, we have to right away say, you know, this is something from God. 
Uh, and, and he's just saying, you know, God, it's exactly. telling to me. And of course he interprets the dreams accurately. Um, and the thing that I see in this situation is, you know, this cupbearer was brought back to this high position of prominence. And of course, Joseph says, Hey, remember me, I'm down here in the dungeon, you know, put in a good word for me in a sense and help me get out of this mess. Right. Um, and the guy just forgets him. As a matter of fact, for two more years, Joseph languages, languishes in this prison. Now, that must have been a very dark time for him, thinking he had his out, thinking he had a way to be able to get sort of the word out who he was. So there's a definitely some tempering, I believe, going on in Joseph's life in these years of hiddenness, if you want to say that. God many times works character into our lives in times of hiddenness and times of difficulty. And I, I can imagine that two, two years must have been very difficult. Somewhere in this period, Isaac dies. So we're guessing around 1886 BC, just to give you an idea where we are in the timeline. Um, so the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, we're seeing those, those men start to pass away. Genesis 41, 16. Um, after this period of the two years is over, uh, there's this thing that comes up with Pharaoh. And the guy remembers, oh, yeah, I know a guy, <laughs> you know. They bring up out of the, the dungeon, and the first thing that he says, again, is that it's beyond my power to do this. He's not taking credit for the interpretation of this dream. And I just see the integrity of Joseph coming through and recognizing uh, that he's wanting God to get the glory for what's happening in this situation. He's not trying to take the glory his life. So it's just a great pattern that's starting to develop in his life. Um, we see that after the interpretation of the dreams and he's raised up to sort of the number two man in Egypt, he gives him some, a new name, and it's an interesting name. We see that in verse 45, Pharaoh gave Joseph a new name. It's unpronounceable. I won't try to impress you because I have no clue. But it means God speaks and lives. Remember we talked about the importance of names in the Old Testament. They have meaning, more significance maybe than we are used to having names now. And the great thing is that God can speak prophetically through anybody. Even through unbelievers, uh, we see this in lots of times in the Old Testament through pagan rulers. So here's a, here's a prophetic name given to Joseph, which means God speaks and lives. So it's kind of neat. Um, his boy's name. So he's got two sons that are born in Egypt. Um, the first one, he says, Manasseh means God made me forget all my troubles. And the second, Ephraim, God may be fruitful in the land of my grief. The names of these two boys tell me a little bit about where what's going on in Joseph's life, even after he's been raised up in his position. I think it shows that, you know, he was longing for home. He was still longing for family. I can't imagine to be completely cut off from your culture, from your family, from everything that's familiar and brought into a foreign place. The food's different. The language is different. I mean, everything was different. So, you know, there was probably a longing, and he's I think it reflects on that. And then in the second name, difficult times. I think he is admitting this has been a difficult journey. Things are much better now, of course, as the number two man, but he's gone through some very, very difficult times in Egypt. And I just think it's deep that his son's names reflect that journey and where he's come from. Anything out of the 15th, Dan, you want to add in or anything came out of that? Yeah. Um, <sighs> This whole idea of, of dreaming is, is significant. Um, and uh, a question that came in was, was simply this. Does God still speak to people through dreams? And if he does, should we be looking to people to interpret our dreams? Uh, I, and I say that with the a nod to people who, uh, of God to, uh, to speak on his behalf uh, to interpret those dreams. Uh, if, if God does speak in dreams still, how do we know that they're from God and uh, maybe not last night's pizza giving me bad gas or, or crazy yeah. <laughs> yeah. crazy nighttime uh, thoughts here? Yeah, again, I think there's two extremes. One is we can say, oh, no, dreams aren't trustworthy. God doesn't use them. He doesn't speak through dreams. The scripture is full of God using dreams to bring revelation to people and nations. Sure, yeah. So there's evidence that and I don't see any reason that it stopped after the end of the New Testament. I think God is still doing that. The other thing is we can go the other way and just get so tied up into dreams that we lose perspective on the written word of God and the character of God and the, the community of faith that we're part of. So it does take maturity to be able to process those things. That's why we did that whole class growing in the prophetic. And 
There's lots of information on dreams in there and some other resources. If you want to go into that further, I would watch those videos in that course, Growing in the Prophetic. And Getting to Know the Holy Spirit is another course we did, which you, you dreams would come up. And then there's a third, third course called um, Growing in Spiritual Gifts, which will also uh, talk about that. So we've spent a lot of time over the last three or four years working with those issues and you'll find those videos might be helpful. Yeah, I know those are at oceansidechurch.ca and people can find those if they want. Uh, And in a way we go, thanks for that. Uh, Let's move on to day 16. Yeah, so now the brothers show up and they go down to Egypt because there's a great famine. Uh, Let me just say, Egypt, of course, has the Nile area uh, is in a sense when there are difficult times, when the hardship Traditionally, for centuries, people have moved and migrated toward Egypt uh, because there's water there and because that brings life. And that's exactly what's taking place with uh, Joseph's family in this situation. They're moving in toward uh, Egypt because of the need for grain. So his brothers show up, and of course, this hilarious thing where they don't know who he is, he knows who they are, uh, and they're bowing down to him. So here we go. Here's the fulfillment of a prophetic dream that was, I don't know, 15, 20 years earlier. Uh, and he's recognizing that they're not getting it, but he's definitely seeing what's going on. Um, so we, we see that that timeline of God, that the prophetic sometimes takes a longer time than we think. So Joseph begins this elaborate test for his brothers, you know, to see maybe if they've changed, to see what their heart is. Uh, he, he's got this whole thing going on, trying to discern what's going on in their hearts. Um, and they, at one point there in 42... <laughs> They, they think, oh, man, all this stuff is happening. This is payback. It's payback for us killing Joseph, you know. I just have to laugh because Joseph is speaking through an interpreter, but, of course, he can understand exactly what they're saying because he knows the language. That was his mother tongue. I just the, the humor of God in this, he keeps turning around and wiping his makeup, you know, because he's crying. But uh, So they go through this whole process, and then they leave, and Simeon stays behind. And for two whole years, don't miss the fact that one of those 12 brothers, Simeon, is in captivity in Egypt while they mess around, you know, back trying to decide what they're going to do. Uh, so finally they return um, and the brothers come back. Um, it's kind of neat that Joseph seats them at the big meal in birth order. That must have kind of creeped them out. You know, that's pretty cool if a guy can sort out, you know, 10 or 11 brothers in birth order. Uh, And so, you know, there must have been, they must have been going, what's going on here? Uh, But again, Judah continues to repeat the lie, you know, the one who was gone. And he keeps talking about this thing. The thing about lying is it takes a good memory. Actually, it takes a better memory than I have. I've found the times that I need to lie about something, it just gets bigger and bigger. And then who did I tell? And what do I have to, it's just easier to tell the truth because we see this lie gets more and more complicated as time goes along. But Judah is still going through and, and in talking about that lie. Genesis 45, 5 is just really a key scripture in this too. Um, when Joseph reveals his I- identity finally, there's this, you know, the big reveal in terms of who he is. Um, he says to them, don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. And a little farther down in verse 8, he says, so it was God who sent me here and not you. I just think that shows incredible growth in his maturity, in his ability to forgive, uh, in his perspective on what had taken place. I mean, man, these are the clowns who sold him to slavery. His whole life had been shaped and marred by these marred by these guys' decision. And yet here he is forgiving them and saying, look, there's actually something way bigger going on here uh, than what you thought or what I even thought. And that's the purposes of God. He sent me ahead of you to preserve your lives. Uh, So we see God's bigger purpose in the midst of tragedy and suffering and the things that Joseph had to go through. Anything out of 16 there, Dan? I mean, there's so much content in there and so much. uh, We talked about observation, interpretation, application off the top. There's so much application in that. Uh, I I, I look at the contrast between Judah And Joseph and Judah, as you mentioned, how he keeps the lies up even so many years later. This he's just spoken it over and out uh, so many times that he he believes the lies and it just it just rolls off his tongue now. Yeah, Joseph, the one that disappeared or isn't back, uh, it just was no more. And and when in fact he knew exactly what had happened to Joseph. And in contrast to that, Joseph, Mm -hmm. 
who had matured and who was now forgiving. Uh, it's it's a, just an incredible picture of the two options we have in life, to walk in light, uh, to walk in darkness. Yeah. Uh, one's not always easier, but it's good. The other one is often tougher, and it leads nowhere good. And so, as I read it, just so many application points uh, coming out of coming out of this. Uh, uh, significant. Yeah. Significant. Um, I have no questions on this one, but I do want to back up. I missed one that was uh, given. If I if I might, back to chapter thirty eight. Sure. Chapter 38, verse 8, um, Judah, the story of Judah again. Uh, and chapter 38, 8 talks about a law, or the law that Judah is speaking about, or is speaking about a law. And uh, Emma is curious about that. Uh, the written law, the Mosaic law, is yet to come yet. Right. So what, what law is, is Judah speaking about in this? Yeah, I would say this is maybe more a tradition at this point. Um, don't forget, women, we talked about this last week, had zero rights in this ancient culture. So if your husband died, you couldn't have land, you know, you were destitute. Uh, it was a horrible situation. So a woman was always praying to have a son and a son would preserve her, look after her. That was his responsibility, the firstborn son in her old age. So, so it's kind of a, I would, I just call it a tradition at this point. It definitely gets codified later on. We'll see this in a couple of weeks, this levirate marriage, but it's it's come out of this tradition, I think, of just you know having to protect women from a society and a situation which was utterly destitute. Uh, so so that's what, I think what I'm hearing you say is, look, there are there are local, there are cultural, there are, are national laws yeah. that are at play here, but then there's yeah. also the the big L law of the Lord, which will come later on that's right. with Moses. And so sometimes as we're reading stuff, this would yeah. fall under the the interpretation. What's, what's being said here? Well, in this case, there's some cultural nuance that we, we need to be made aware of. Yeah, and in two weeks, we'll start to talk about the law, and, and yeah, that'll so make the next sense too. So. Let's continue. Yeah, good. So we're on the 17th yeah. now. Uh, I'm just sure the favor that God gives the family because of Joseph's role. I mean, these guys are nobodies. They're shepherds, and Egyptians detest shepherds. You know, and he wouldn't have ever had a second look at this motley crew that's coming to buy grain. But because of the favor of Joseph and the integrity of Joseph, basically the, the Pharaoh, the most powerful person in the entire land, just opens up a wide open door for them and welcomes them into, to, you know, where things are. And um, it's just this, this favor of God. You see this coming, this, this thing of the cream rising to the top. But God opening a door through Joseph's integrity for this, really the preservation of the whole family. Um, so the word gets back to the father finally and uh, that his son is alive. And in Genesis 46, 2 and 4, um, um, God speaks directly to Jacob. And during the night, Jacob in a vision and said, Jacob, Jacob, here I am, Jacob replied. God said, I am the God, the God of your father, the voice said, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. For there I'll make your family into a great nation. I will go with you down to Egypt, and I will bring you back again. You will die in Egypt, but Joseph will be with you to close your eyes. This begins a really key theme that we're going to come back to lots and lots and lots. It's this relationship between the people of God and Egypt. As I mentioned before, with the Nile River, there's lots of times when in history of the nation of Egypt where things are difficult. So when we think about these two, the nation of Israel and the nation of Egypt, um, it's a long story. And sometimes God says yes to his people to go to Egypt for resources or protection. Uh, sometimes in the history, the long history, which we'll start to talk about more, uh, actually Israel and allies against you know, northern forces that descend. We'll talk about those in time long. So sometimes God definitely gives the green light to connect with Egypt for resources or for, you know, allies in war. But there are many other times in scripture where God says no to his people, don't, don't get involved with Egypt. Uh, and there are times when Egypt and Israel are mortal enemies throughout history. So there's a dance here that's very important. And I think it's significant that God is saying, uh, it's okay, Jacob, for you to go down. Because earlier his father wanted to go, if you remember, down to Egypt to Egypt in the time of famine, and God said, no, stay in the land and plant. And of course, God blessed him, even in the midst of a difficult 
situation in that situation. So we just watch for when God says it's okay to go and when God says it's not okay to go as you read through because it's a significant part of the deal. So then we come, they arrive in uh, uh, Goshen, and it's interesting that the, uh, right before that in uh, 4627, um, so all the members of Jacob's family in the land of Egypt. <laughs> this really surprises me. So after three generations, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the promise in the in the in promise the, in the in the, in the Abraham, Abrahamic covenant of land, you know, as far as you can see from ocean to ocean, and and blessing and and you know, offspring as numerous as the sand and the seashore. And can you count the stars? They'll be like that. After three generations, <laughs> we've got seventy members of this family going down. That's the extent of the realized component of God's promise at this point. Uh, it just helps me see that God's time line is long run. God is a long run timetable. And we mentioned that last week, but I really see that here, but also don't despise the day of small beginnings. Uh, I would call this a family, maybe a tribe at this point. It's not a nation. I keep saying nation because I know that's coming, but it's really just a, a family tribe, but don't dis despise those days of, of small beginnings. Um, Genesis uh, 47, 25. So they're settled in the land. Um, it's interesting that there's a blessing here. Um, God uses Jacob to bless Pharaoh. Um, this is very interesting because, again, this is just a, a family head, and here's the, the head of the entire nation, Pharaoh, and yet Jacob is blessing Pharaoh. Um, the greater blesses the lesser. So I just see the, the hand of God, and it's just it's outrageous, actually, that he would be in a situation where he's blessing the Pharaoh of Egypt. And Pharaoh is receiving those blessings. But remember the Abrahamic covenant. This is the beginning of the blessing component. He's blessing nations through this family. And here's a maybe the very beginning of that. Um, so we see that later on, as I mentioned, I was jumping ahead a little bit. Genesis 47, 25. Uh, the people of Egypt say, you've saved our lives, speaking to this plan to save the grain up. Um, and it's just neat that Joseph's God-given prophetic foresight saves not only his family, those 70 that came down, but actually God uses him to save an entire nation. Um, so it's just a very significant role that he's played in this. Um, and Genesis uh, in, and Egypt becomes an incubator for the nation of Israel. Genesis 47, 27. Mean, meanwhile, the people of Israel settled in the region of Goshen in Egypt. There they acquired property and were fruitful and their population grew rapidly. So here's God providing the incubator of a pagan state, uh, you know, of to incubate this new nation as it moves out from 70 into millions, as we'll see in a couple hundred years. So 17th, that's the end. Anything there, Dan? No questions on this one. Let's, uh, let's continue to push through and uh, do our Phew. last day, the 18th. <laughs> All right, let's power through into the 18th. So um, Genesis 47, 29. So we see uh, Jacob's death is drawing near. And Jacob's last sort of faith request is this. Don't bury me in Egypt. When I die, please take my body out of Egypt and bury me with my ancestors. I just see this as such a faith response, a faith-filled response. He believed in the realization of the Abrahamic covenant. He believed what his father had been told, his grandfather had been told about the land they never owned anything except a little burial plot in this promised land at this point. But I just think it's neat that he says, don't bury me here. I belong in that land that God has promised. I need to rest with my ancestors in that land of promise. And, you know, a good thing about a good way to think about faith or a component of faith is it's believing before things are realized, believing the promises of God before you can see them with your own eyes. And this is in a great illustration of Jacob doing that saying, look, don't bury me here. Take me down and bury me in the promised land, which, of course, is exactly what happens. Um, in this process, Jacob claims Joseph's two boys. We see that where he comes in and has the boys come in front of him. Something that I was misunderstood for lots of years. I couldn't figure out why in the 12 tribes there was no tribe of Joseph. <laughs> so basically what his father has done is he said, I'm taking these grandsons as my own. And so when you see the 12 tribes of Israel, now we've got the half tribes of these two boys 
Ephraim and Manasseh, that's where you get those other half tribes. And that's why in the biblical times, there's no tribe of Joseph uh, because Jacob takes these boys as his own. He treats them in an inheritance perspective, just like his, his natural born son. So uh, it takes up that situation, but great situation where he comes in um, and he blesses those boys. Um, and again, the younger gets blessed over the elder or put in front of the elder. And of course, you know, his father's freaking out because he's crossed his arms and no, that's not right. You know, you're not blessing the right one. And Jacob says, I know, you know, you think I can't see, but I know what's going on. Um, and it just shows me that God's ways often conflict with our human traditions. There's things that God does in his wisdom that sometimes look to us wrong or backwards. Um, and we have to learn to trust him in those situations because we see as history unfolds, this is exactly what happened with these two boys. Um, and then Jacob blesses his sons. Um, this is a powerful thing. And I've read this blessing lots in my lifetime. And I just wondered, how have we lost this? You know, how have we lost the aged among us blessing us as they come close to death? It's a powerful thing uh, that we've lost, but he blesses each of his sons. Genesis 49, 28. Um, I wish I could say I understood all the blessings. I don't for sure. But the scripture says that it was appropriate for each in 49, 28. Um, interesting that his firstborn, I mentioned this before, but um, when he talked about his firstborn, he said, you went to bed with my wife and you defiled my marriage couch. Remember we talked about what um, the firstborn Reuben had done, and, and this comes back to this penalty for that so that's not the first time we're going to run into that it'll we'll see it later in scripture and other so he blesses his sons um and and then jacob dies now we're probably maybe 1859 bc um and jacob's body is returned to the promised land they had this big funeral profession procession so abraham isaac and jacob those are the the patriarchs that i am the god of and now that third one has died and joseph remains um, but as soon as their dad dies, the brothers begin to get nervous, <laughs> of course, because it's like, okay, dad's out of the way. Now is it going to be payback time for what we did? Uh, they're still very worried about that. And they come before him and, you know, bow before him again. Uh, but Jake, uh, Joseph says something very interesting. And I think to me, this is one of the most powerful scriptures in all of the book of Genesis. I just have come back to this scripture so many times in my life. Um, it's just huge for me, but it, in Genesis 50, 20, so the brothers are blessed. And here's what Joseph comes up in from 50, 20. He said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. That's such an amazing perspective that it shows the maturity that's taken place in, in Joseph's life. He's gone through all these trials and he sees the outworking of the hand of God in his life to say, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God's purposes are so much bigger than all our human sin and stupidity. <laughs> I mean, that's this is one thing you could say about the whole Bible. His purposes are so much greater than all the mess ups that we do, the sins that we do and the sins that are done to us. Uh, his purposes stand. One Bible commentator said, God ultimately overrules human sin for his glory. Uh, and that's an amazing thing about who God is in a sin-fallen world, in a messed-up, evil world. God still accomplishes his purposes and his purposes for his glory. And that perspective is seen by Joseph. And I just love that part of the book um, in sort of as we close that at the end of, of this book. So Joseph dies eventually a number of years after that. This is maybe 1805 B.C. now. But... Again, like his father, he has a final prophetic act. He says, promise to carry my bones out of Egypt. So again, he is prophetically saying, I want to be buried in the promised land, the land that God promised to my grandfather, to my great-grandfather, my great grandfather, my father, uh, three generations. I want to be buried in that land. I don't see the fulfillment of that, but I believe in the promise of that, and that's where I want to be buried. The cool thing is that actually happened 400 years later. When we get to Exodus in two weeks, we'll see the very thing. They took Joseph's bones when they left Egypt and brought them back into the promised land. So, again, the long-term, long-run plan of God. Here's 400 years later 
that the fulfillment of this prophetic wish is taking place with the nation of God. So i uh, just blown away about the sovereignty of God and how he sees the big picture. Many times we lose track of that. Any questions of that in the 18th, Dan? Um, yeah, no, we didn't have any questions on that. Uh, I guess for myself, uh, I've just been impressed again, and you mentioned it here about uh, that idea of faith, believing God before things are realized. Uh, this yeah. this lesson from Joseph uh, on uh, this last Sunday at the church that we're a part of at Oceanside uh, in Nanaimo, yeah. uh, Wes spoke and he shared this idea that God isn't so much into into moments, but that He's into a process. Sometimes moments will start a process, but very rarely is God right. about just the the moment. Uh, it's usually a, a moment unto something greater, and. That's shown to us through the life of Joseph and through the life, life of his brothers. Uh, God's interested in the process. He's up to something. His fingerprints right. are on it. And uh, our job is to lean back into that, to trust that, uh, and have that faith that even though we don't see it, uh, that we trust God that he's up to something. And ultimately, even though there might be suffering and challenges through it, it's, it's for our good. Yeah. You know, the take home for me in the end of Genesis is obviously coming out of that Genesis yeah. fifty twenty, um, when he said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. I'll just tell you a story in our own life, um, 15 or 20 years ago, in a very different time, in a very different place. Um, I was a youth pastor and a small groups pastor in a wonderful church, um, worked for a wonderful senior pastor, I had a really good relationship with. There was a uh, worship pastor. The three of us just made up a really neat team, very, very different in gifting and personality, but working together. And God was blessed. There was kingdom things happening. Uh, you know, it was, I felt like it, we were on the edge of revival in that situation. And it was a very exciting time as that team began to honor and work together in, in that situation. But in the midst of that, some powerful people rose up in the church who did not like what was going on. Um, and there was a, a backlash against some of the changes and some of the newness maybe that was taking place. And because of the ecclesiastical system we're involved in, uh, I ended up getting voted out of the pastorate and our senior pastor as well uh, and asked to leave the ministry uh, immediately. So just, just, for, just for clarity here, right. you got fired from church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's you, you got to be pretty good Excellent. to do that, right? Only to a youth pastor, right? That well, Yeah, just yuck it up, <laughs> anyway, bro. Okay, just sorry, yuck it up. I'm bearing my heart continue. here, okay? <laughs> um, so this was a very, very difficult time in my life. Uh, I felt betrayed. Um, I was really struggling with unforgiveness. And it was very much a time of brokenness uh, in my life, uh, in, in for my life for Dean and I and our family. I, I could not see the purposes of God in this. It just looked like the enemy had had a field heyday and um, something very significant and very special that had been stopped of what God's activity was. That was my perspective on it. So it took a long time, uh, you know, years before I was able to, I, you know, I had to choose to forgive and choose to bless. Um, and I, I did that over and over when I didn't feel like it as I, things came up and thoughts came up and, um, but the sovereignty of God, after a while, I see his hands now, after maybe six or eight years of perspective, that what I would call great trial in our life or tragedy brought us to Nanaimo and brought us into the family at Oceanside Church. And God began to grow us and heal us through that thing. And, and God brought maturity through our time at Oceanside, which has been maybe, I don't know, 14 or 15 years now. Uh, there was a healing that came through that. And, um, we got to know the Holy Spirit in a way that we probably would not have if we had not gone through that. Uh, we got to experience spiritual gifts in new ways because of what God was doing at Oceanside. I learned a lot about spiritual warfare during that, which I never knew during that period of time. And God matured me and grew me in my understanding of experience and in, in victory and walking in spiritual, the protection of God from my family and from my life. Well, we grew in prophetic ministry and understanding prophetic ministry and being around it in a prophetic community. So all I can say is that after, you know, many years or, you know, a couple decades, I see the perspective of God in this. And, and I can honestly say that, you know, you meant it for harm, but God used it for his glory. And I just feel like there may be some others that are watching this 
broadcasts that are maybe in times like that of great, great difficulty. I just want to try to encourage you to see God as the long run God and that he can take and make beautiful things out of broken situations. Um, you know, he brings glory from ashes. Uh, and we definitely have seen in our life and can testify to the goodness of that. And I think that's the whole point of the story of Joseph in, in Genesis to remind us that, yes, bad things happen to us. We do bad things, uh, but God is sovereign and he works those things for those that lean into him uh, and tenderize our hearts for them. He can make beautiful things come out of that. That's good. Yeah. So let's pray and uh, I'll turn it back to Dan. Lord, thank you for your goodness. And Lord, we just declare that you are the God who makes beautiful things out of wreckage. And we thank you that you do that in our lives. Lord, I pray if there's someone listening who is going through those times, Lord, that Holy Spirit, you would speak to them. Give them the perspective of your loyal love uh, in the midst of that difficulty. And Lord, help them to have the faith to know that you will bring about your purposes even in the midst of those difficult times. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Right on. Mark. Thanks yeah, so much. Thank it's always great to have you and to lean into it. Uh, it's I've even got I've even got comments and stuff popping up right now. So it's uh, it's great that people are engaging here, and I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to next week. Now, do you want to share a little bit about what the plan is is for next week? Yeah. So it's a little bit weird. Um, I'm going into surgery uh, this next week, and I'll talk about that a little bit. So we have pre-recorded uh, the whole book of Job already. The, the teaching portion. We've had yeah. some questions. The teaching, yeah, the teaching component of Job has been pre-recorded, but we had some questions early on, so we are interacting with questions. But Dan is going to continue in live stream like we've just done next week at seven seventeen. But I'm not going to be there. I'm probably going to be in the hospital uh, recovering. And um, but I just we've already captured that video. But I just want you to know that I feel like that was a significant thing that God did. So I encourage you, it's going to be a little bit different. You won't see me live, but Dan will be live and we'll be quarterbacking that teaching this next week. So please do plug in. There's lots of questions about Job next week. And I, I just felt like God's hand was over that recording and I'm excited to see what he does um, this next week. So yeah. hope you can join and like us. Like I say, uh, as you said, uh, we've pre-recorded the teaching portion. Uh, we'll still be live. We'll still be interacting on it. But you're right. It was a significant teaching time and some of the pre-questions that got sent in were were. I think will be incredibly helpful for people to hear and and interact with. So it'll be great. Thanks so much, Mark. We appreciate you and your teaching this week. And to everybody who's joined us, it's been great to have you. Uh, once again, if uh, you have the chance to share on your social media the podcast addresses uh, for this on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and as well, just uh, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, Right now, just below what you're watching, just below here, there's a share button. Uh, we would encourage you just to copy that and to paste it in uh, to your socials and let other people know that this is happening. Tell friends, tell family, uh, tell others because uh, we're seeing it have significant impact in people's lives. And, uh, and it's exciting. It's exciting. So, uh, guys, until next week, thanks so much for being here. Have a great week. Uh, next week, we're going to be day 19 through day 31 on your readings. So keep an eye on that. Cover those readings. Uh, if you need the resources, they're at oceanside.ca slash oceansidechurch.ca slash 2020. We'll talk to you guys again in another seven days. Uh, it'll be great. Have a good one. Bye now. Mm -hmm.